Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. As we return to our study in Ezekiel 33, and we begin again where we left off this last week, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction? Shall we thank him for his blessing of these Sabbath hours and seek his guidance as we open his word so that we might more clearly understand that which we need to know at our time at this time? Let us now kneel and praise him as we welcome these hours of Sabbath and this study before us. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you provide, especially for these hours of the Sabbath. We pray, Father, for your direction now <clears throat> as we open your word. Help us now that our minds may be open to receive that that you would have us to understand. We ask, Father, for your blessing. We also ask for your watch care on those that are not with us at this time. Be with Theodore as he backpacks. Direct us now and guide us so that your will may be done. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We praise you for your loving kindness. We ask that your angels may surround us wherever we are. And we ask, Father, that your spirit may help our minds focus on that which is soon to be before us. Be with us now, we ask. For these things, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last Sabbath, we were reading letter 30 of 1895. Now, paragraph 15 is pretty simple in that we would turn to 1 John 3, 3 to 8 and verse 10. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him. Neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. 1 John 3, 3 to 8, and verse 10. <clears throat> Mrs. White continues, read the whole chapter, for it will be applied to your case by the Holy Spirit of God. Read also Ezekiel 33, 1 to 16. Let the Holy Spirit come into your heart and abide there, and let Satan be expelled from the soul temple. Now, here she is combining the writings of John the apostle john the revelator and she is combining the words of the prophet ezekiel this is a very strong admonition because if this is to be applied to our case by the holy spirit we need to very carefully consider what she is saying if you will open the door of your heart to jesus you may enjoy the richest blessing isn't this key for all of us if we're not willing to open our hearts if we're closing portions of our heart off how can we ever be blessed he says and who is this that is he this is christ i counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyesalve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man heareth my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. 
to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am sat down with my father in his throne. Revelation 3, 18 to 21. So here, this portion of Ezekiel is bookended. First John 3, 3 to 8, and verse 10, and now Revelation 3, 18 to 21. What can we take from this? Okay, now, comment that's made from the chat. Christ incarnated was manifested to destroy Satan's works. This should encourage us to overcome his wiles by calling on Christ to expel Satan's influence in our lives, our humanity from our lives. Our humanity combined with his divine power can accomplish this. Do we have a, do we have a question about that? Can our humanity be combined with the divine power? And can this be truly accomplished? What do you think? Oh, for sure. It can. Okay. But in, I've found in my experience anyway that to accomplish it, God first humbles me in the dust so that my pride doesn't get in the way. And my pride even keeps me from asking for it. It doesn't seem like pride, but there's there's a type of pride that's it's not lifted up pride. It's the pride of the worm. I call it, and uh, it's thinking of ourselves something that we are not, basically. So we stand in need, and sometimes I'll deny that need, uh, cross my arms, and say, "Go away! I don't need you. I don't. I don't. Well, not to God. I don't ever say that, really. But I do uh, do it by my actions or choices." Okay. Push him away. Push him away, and and he he keeps coming back, knocking on the door of my heart, and uh, opening that door. One of the things that keeps me from opening that door is the intense pain that I feel. Um, so that uh, I feel like I'm just going to fall apart sometimes if I, if I let it happen. But when I have let it happen, it's been very healing. And that's a cleansing kind of pain. So are you saying that the pain is kind of like an infection? The pain is from, I'm sure, the infection of sin. But I would say it's the pain is from interaction with the world. And sometimes I don't even understand it. Well, I don't really understand it at this point. Working on that particular points okay any other comment well i was thinking of those verses in job about uh, he make it make it sore and bind us up he wounds us but his hands make whole okay amen faithful are the how's that go the kisses of an enemy are deceitful but the wounds of a friend are faithful all right now this next portion is quite blunt God has laid weighty responsibilities upon men who are placed in position of trust. They are to watch for souls as they that must give an account. They must be endowed with the Holy Spirit, which is the appointed agency through whom men may represent Christ in all places and at all times. Now, many times we're hearing about our great need of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Sister White writes it, that the Holy Spirit is the appointed agency through whom men must be endowed to represent Christ in all places and at all times. Is this saying that the Holy Spirit has been fully poured out at this time? No. I believe what we're waiting for, we're looking for, is the outpouring of the latter rain. And I... I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the outpouring of the latter rain will not happen and cannot happen until, until we each have the experience of Isaiah. Well, I am the man with unclean lips, I am undone. 
until we're undone in our own estimations or I, I don't no. think the Holy Spirit can dwell with us. I oh. mean, he does, but he doesn't fully like the latter rain. When you're speaking of the outpouring of the latter rain, if we look at the example, when the former rain was poured out, what had to occur first? Reconciliation among the brethren was a big thing coming together, meeting in the upper room. And what occurred in that meeting in the upper room? Well, they they confessed their sins to not that they confessed confess sins that they had, where they had hurt each other or denied Christ. They they had a twelve step meeting, basically, realizing that they couldn't, believing that God could, and then allowing him to. Yes, opening the door. Now <clears throat> Christ said to his disciples, Nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is gone, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not in me. John sixteen seven to 9 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Holy Spirit will reprove of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged by the Lord God of heaven and the whole angelic family. John 16, 10 to 11. Here again, the very passages that we quote many times about a message to the world from John the Apostle are being combined with Ezekiel 33. What does that say to us? What does that show us at this time? Now, Mrs. White continues, and from the Desire of Ages, page 556, we have the following. The Christian in his business life is to represent to the world the manner in which our Lord would conduct business enterprises. In every transaction, he is to make it manifest that God is his teacher. Holiness unto the Lord is to be written upon day books and ledgers on deeds, receipts, and bills of exchange. Those who profess to be followers of Christ and who deal in an unrighteous manner are bearing false witness against the character of a holy, just, and merciful God. Every converted soul will, like Zacchaeus, signalize the entrance of Christ into his heart by an abandonment of the unrighteous practices that have marked his life. Like the chief publican, he will give proof of his sincerity by making restitution. The Lord says, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again he, that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He shall surely live. Ezekiel 33, 15, and 16. If we have injured others through any unjust transaction, if we have overreached in trade or defrauded any man, even though it be within the pale of the law, we should confess our wrong and make restitution as far as it lies in our power. It is right for us to restore not only that which we have taken, but all that it would have accumulated if put to a right and wise use during the time it has been in our possession. Now, that's that's quite a statement. Any comment on this? I have a friend who took that to heart very literally. It took them about 10 years of living on next to nothing so that he could do that. It's, it was, it almost seemed irrational, but okay. he was determined to do it. And, you know, he did. Eh? God blessed him for it. Okay. It's a good testimony. Now, Ezekiel thirty-three seventeen. Here again, we have this little marker that tells us 
we're, we're going to open another scroll, that we're going into another thought. We have something further to continue to assess. Yet the children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. What children are being referred to here? And who is thy people? Are we addressing here the children of the robbers of thy people? What do we see here? Who is saying the way of the Lord is not equal? Who is saying here that the Lord is not being fair? O house of Israel. So at this point, are we looking at this in the literal or are we looking at this in spiritual terms? Now, I'm going to drop back for a moment while you're considering your answer. Because the comment from the chat is this. When we write to a brother to complain of some of his opinions, let us consider it three days before we write. Pray God nine times to direct us before we wake up, before we, excuse me, take up the pen. Read it in the room of our brother. Pretend that we're the recipient three times before we send it. Seal it only when we love him for being godlike. Send it when we would delight to be the bearer. While it is going, think with what tears of joy he will devour its contents. And remember to pay the postage. William Miller is quoted in Bliss Memoirs of William Miller, page 355, paragraph 3. How many times have we ever done this? Or how many times have we had something that's offended us that a brother or a sister has said? And we immediately dash off a comment. We immediately make a comment that is just expressing our total outrage. I have more than I can count. Okay. I stand with you, brother. I understand what that's like. We need a speed bump between our brain and our mouth. That speed bump is the Holy Spirit. Well, one of the things that my mother used to say is we need to engage the brain before we put the mouth in gear. That's right. Too many of us have a mouth that's very much like a car with a, a loud engine. And when that car is in neutral, we can rev it up all we want, yet we're not putting our brain in gear. We're not really connected with anything else. We're not thinking things through. Comment here again from the chat. Engage the brain reflecting the higher nature, a mind renewed by the word by Christ. I would agree with that. Now, this verse, Ezekiel thirty-three seventeen, the translators would pair it with <clears throat> Ezekiel thirty-three twenty, which we're going to come to in a few minutes, which states, Yet ye say, The way of the Lord is not equal. O ye house of Israel, I will judge you, every one after his ways. And Ezekiel eighteen twenty-five, Yet ye say, The way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? And Ezekiel 18.29, Yet saith the house of Israel, The way of the Lord is not equal, O house of of Israel. Are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Okay? Again, from the chat on, on our previous thought, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. James 1, 19 and 20. Well stated. Now, is the way of man the way of God? No, Your ways are not my ways. Okay. The Lord declares, the children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? And not that he should return from his ways and live? Therefore I will judge you, O house of of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourself from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. 
cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Therefore turn yourselves and live ye. Ezekiel 18, 25, 23, 30 to 32. Here the Lord has plainly revealed his will concerning the salvation of the sinner. And the attitude which many assume in expressing doubts and unbelief as to whether the Lord will save them is a reflection upon the character of God. Those who complain of his justice and severity are virtually saying, the way of the Lord is not equal. But he distinctly throws back the imputation upon the sinner. Your ways are not equal. Can I pardon your transgressions when you do not repent and turn from your sins? So what do we think here? Now, I have known those in my life that have told me, well, if there's, if there's going to be another earth, if there's actually a heaven, I'm going to be there because I'm a good person. It doesn't matter if I've slandered somebody. It doesn't matter if I've had an affair. It doesn't matter if I have taken something that I shouldn't have taken. I'm still a good person at heart. What does this passage say to us? Can I pardon your transgressions when you do not repent and turn from your sins? In the upper room, in that experience that was held in the time when Christ ascended to his father's house, what did those assembled at the upper room do? Now, the comment from the chat, Proverbs 6, 2, thou art a snare with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Pretty direct. But what happened in that upper room experience? What are we told from Scripture occurred? Your question again? Okay. Based on an attitude of, I am a good person. It doesn't matter what I've done. I'm still a good person at heart. Mrs. White makes the comment, can I pardon your transgressions when you do not repent or turn from your sins? So I'm applying this to the experience of the upper room and those that were in the upper room. What did they do in the upper room that led to the outpouring of the former rain? Acts 1.14 says they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, which apparently included confessing and repenting of their sins and making things right between them. Right. This is the stage that we are in today. This is the point that no matter what we're looking at, how we're looking at it, that we need to consider. We are living the message to Laodicea. We are in the position <clears throat> just before the outpouring of the latter rain. And is the, <clears throat> is the outpouring of the latter rain going to occur any differently than it did when the former rain was, out, was given? Doesn't Jesus show the end from the beginning? Always. So and what the is our... A, go ahead. And an end of a thing is better than the beginning. So what's our responsibility today? Same as every day would be uh, to uh, go to anyone that is hurt. Don't wait. Don't delay. It could turn out that either they die or we die or be separated by time and distance. Not have that opportunity again. I know that... Uh, Doing that, if if you don't even have the opportunity, is to just write a letter to that person. You you don't send it; they're dead. But <clears throat> you uh, you write it as though you had that opportunity. And there's something that that's healing even in that. Okay. Now, from a non-published 
letter, letter 155 of 1910. We are placed under heavy responsibilities before the world and angels and men. Here is expressed our responsibilities. It is the purpose of God that divine and human shall unite their instrumentalities in the proclamation of the warning message. What warning message are we to proclaim? What warning message did, did John the Baptist proclaim? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Exactly. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Is the message of Revelation 14 any different than John the Baptist's message? Or is it just a bit more refined and a bit more pointed? I think it's a repeat and enlarge on what he has. Okay. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. How different is this from repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand? It seems a strange thing. Oh, it breaks it into small. Go, please, please. I just said it breaks it breaks it up up into steps to follow. Are these I steps? agree. It sounds like the same thing, really. A fear God is would include repentance. Um, yeah. Right. It has to include repentance. It seems a strange thing to commit so large a trust to human beings. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman over the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, in his sin. But his blood I will require it at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O, son, o thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus she speaks, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how shall we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and life. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Therefore, Thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby. In the day when he turneth from his wickedness, neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I say to the righteous, that he shall surely live. If he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered. But for iniquity, for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he hath had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Yet the children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. The way of the Lord is not fair, is another way of putting it. Read this chapter, including verse 20. Read Ezekiel 33. Here the Lord is speaking in explicit language. To all who study this chapter, it is simple and plain. It is the word of God 
and to every church who will keep the way of the Lord is given the particular statement. If the church desires the blessing of God, if the church desires the blessing of the Lord, let them consider their ways and correct the evils. Let every church member take heed to his ways in every particular to correct any evils in any manner and repent and be converted that his sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come. What are the times of refreshing? Burning of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So if the Holy Spirit cannot be poured out until there is unity, until until we have made it right with our other brothers and sisters in prayer and in supplication, then who is blocking the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? To our souls. So we are blocking the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Is that correct? Yes, I hope so. Here she is giving a very specific admonition. It's no wonder that the church had not wanted to publish this letter. Is this pointing the finger at all sorts of other people, or is this pointing a finger directly at us? It starts with us. So yes, it does. Amen. Starting point. Okay. This starts with us. Now here, we return to what Ezekiel's had to say. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not equal. O you house of Israel, I will judge you every one after his ways. Now, before we continue with what Mrs. White had to say, let's see what the translator saw. So Ezekiel 33, 18, they pair that with 1826 and 1827. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. And when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul and live. Is this not giving us witnesses to the fact that this, this concept of once saved, always saved is a fallacy? Right. Now, in Ezekiel 33.20, this portion that says the way of the Lord is not equal, the translators went back, to Ezekiel 33, 17, along with Ezekiel 18, 25, and 29. Yet the children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal, but as for them, their way is not equal. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not equal. A nice repeat. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? We need to consider that God is fair in every dealing. We are the ones that are not fair. From the chat. It sounds to me that Acts 3.19 equates the outpouring of the latter rain with the acceleration of completion of the sealing when blotting out of sins is accomplished. Okay? Now, another comment. There are four personal letters that Ellen White wrote complaining about James and his treatment of her after his series of strokes. She wanted Lucinda to burn the letters. Dear Sister Lucinda, I am sorry I wrote you the letters I have. Whatever may have been my feelings, I need not have troubled you with them. Burn all my letters, and I will relate no matters that perplex me to you. The sin bearer is my refuge. 
He has invited me to come to him for rest when weary and heavy laden. I will not be guilty of uttering a word again, whatever may be the circumstances. Silence in all things of a a disagreeable or perplexing character has ever been a blessing to me. When I have departed from this, I have regretted it so much. We find this published in Daughters of God, 271.2. And, of course, the comment is made. These letters were not burned. Now, the Lord has his chosen instrumentalities to do the work that Christ would do were he upon the earth in person. Of his ministers, he said, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt bear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak, to warn the wicked from his way. The wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, If he is not turned from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trusts to his own righteousness and committeth iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Again, I say, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Ezekiel 33, 7 to 10 and 12 to 16. Thus, It is that the word of the Lord is to be spoken unto the people. The warning is to be respected and the message received. The people are not to set themselves up to think evil or to speak evil of God's messengers. Who are God's messengers? Who are God's messengers? Who are the watchmen? It's we. We are the watchmen, right? Right. The people are not to set themselves up to think evil or to speak evil of God's messengers. But this has been done in Sydney. Some of the brethren have found fault and accused the messengers of God. And as a result, unbelief has been sown in the hearts of the people. Complaint of God's messengers often amounts to complaint of God. Hear the word of the Lord. The children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right. He shall live thereby. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not equal. O you house of Israel, I will judge you every one after his ways. Verses 17 to 20. Brethren, your lives are sadly defected. Your lives are sadly defective. If you need to be converted in order to be vessels fit for the master's use, you need this conversion. I need this conversion. We need this conversion. We have lost much time. We have failed to obtain a correct experience. We have not been agents through whom the Holy Spirit could communicate. Yes, I'm changing the words. I'm making them present 
tense for us. It is the Spirit's work to convince us not of other people's sins, but of my own sin. Amen. If I had obtained the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he had sent, if I had represented Christ in character, I would not have been a scourge to the church, but a saver of life unto life. Will I see myself as I really am? Will I humble my heart before God and pray as I have never before prayed? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. If we're not willing to take this personally, if we're not willing to face this directly, we have a problem. I have a problem. Is that clear? To all, way I've always looked at it. <clears throat> excuse me, and I do. When I have a difficulty with someone, I I draw back and consider what my part was in it, because that's the only thing I can change. And uh, I go with my part to that person, and I don't point out the problem they're having, but I point out my problem I'm having, and ask you know say sorry that's uh what we have to do yeah not point out the other things we're not the holy spirit and often people often i'll try to you know be the holy spirit do his job you know oh you should read this you need to read that oh this is really good that's for you <laughs> forgetting that god directs us to read things to apply to ourselves we often fumble it when we try to do God's work instead of allowing him to work through us or even stand by and not complain, but just let God do his work. It's not easy when major things are, are when your whole life can be taken from you, like everything that you have and not want vengeance. That's a feeling that I learned about um, in a very difficult way. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's not easy, but it do, do, does show me that that uh, what was in my heart, you know, wanting to do that, and uh, it was it's been good to learn that. All right. Any other thoughts or comments right now? What is the work before us in the coming days? I would have to say that we need to consider much more directly the prayer of David in Psalm 51. Create in my brother or my sister a clean heart, right? Isn't that what David prayed? Right. Really? Did David pray to create a clean heart in someone else? No, in himself. Right. So my challenge for all of us, before we meet again next Sabbath, consider carefully, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Consider also the passage that follows. Let's be prepared to cover this when we meet again next Sabbath. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions at this time? Okay, let us then close this session with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. Help us, Father, that we may not let pride stand in the way. Direct us, Father, so that we may come and have a true upper room experience so that we may accept the warnings and the admonitions to the Laodiceans. Help us to go forward so that we may truly be prepared for the outpouring of your spirit. Direct us to this end. Help us, we pray, for we are weak and feeble, and we are in great need of you. Be with those that were not able to join with us today. Direct us 
in the path that you would have us to follow. For this, Father, we thank you, and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.